the Startup Hour, giving entrepreneurs education, motivation, and inspiration from successful entrepreneurs from all corners of the country. The Startup Hour is a weekly business program bringing successful Zambian entrepreneurs, policymakers, and subject experts to share their stories, answer your burning business questions, and inform you on best practices. Tune in to the Startup Hour every Tuesday from 9 a.m. Startup Hour in association with Power FM. Very good morning indeed. My name is Patrick Chifuambo. Today on the Startup Hour, we discuss feeding Zambia, unlocking Zambia's agricultural potential with Lillian Lydia, founder of the Twala. Lillian Lydia Dakamumba is a professional chef with experience in uh, Sweden, Zambia, France, and Switzerland. She is a food writer for the Post newspaper Zambia. She was born in Lusaka, Zambia, raised in Sweden, and studied in Switzerland. She is also chef and owner of uh, the Twala companies under which she runs and operates the Twala restaurant. Uh, she studied at the Caesar Ritz Culinary Arts Academy in Switzerland. In 2010, she received a membership certificate from the French Association Devoir du Champignon. In 2011, she was honored with a certificate for the creator of African fusion modern cuisine. Lillian Media has featured on the travel channel CNN DHL Africa, where she got to teach the world about the Zambian cuisine and eating culture. She's now ventured into agriculture and uh, print with uh, Twala Magazine and Twala Farms. I have a quote for our guests and our listeners, and it goes as follows. It is not just about the, the amount of food we grow, it's also about the type of food that we eat. That's from Kofi Annan, chair of the Kofi Annan Foundation. Lillian, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. We appreciate you taking time to share your journey with us and to discuss uh, entrepreneurship and business in Zambia and Africa at large. Very good morning to you. Good morning. How are you? I'm joined by my co-host, uh, Mopich Saka Jr. Good morning to you. Super, Patrick. How are you? Fantastic. Let's get that straight into it. What was, uh, was there any particular family member that encouraged you to pursue your passion of uh, cooking? Well, I'll basically... Or cuisine, should I say. <laughs> oh, you mean going to the culinary arts? Um, my whole family has been involved in the, culin in the restaurant industry and then agriculture. So for me, I felt like it came as a natural thing to do. And my grandmother was a very big influence in that. And also my aunt was also a very big influence in that. When, when did you know that uh, you had a passion for cuisine or for cooking? It was 2009 when I just graduated from high school. And then I was thinking, what do I want to do? further how am I going what am I going to further on my education and advance it and then I realized like oh I love cooking and you can actually make a living out of it and that's when I decided to be a chef did, did you start cooking at an early age yes I did I did I think we had home in, in Zambia we'd call it home economics so I didn't grow up here mm -hmm. but when I, when I was in Sweden when I was in school we had home economic uh, economics and we used to cook a lot so I knew that my passion was there and I thought like okay I can advance myself. Growing up uh, outside Zambia, were you into cooking uh, Zambian dishes, or was it more what what uh, was the custom in that particular country? Basically, I come from a very traditional family. Even though we've grown up outside and we can say modern, but we're very traditional in keeping our values. I have a solely mother, so she 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 made sure that I knew the language, I knew the food, and how to cook it. Uh, I've always had a passion for Zambian cuisine and Zambian culture. In, in whole, but I've also been exposed to so many cultures and cuisines, so it's more or less I'm a blend of everything. I'm a fusion. Mm -hmm. Even my food represents that. Even my business represents that. So I think it's a fusion of everything. Let, let me take you back to the, to the name of uh, your business, Ntwala. Did I, did I pronounce that right? No, I, I, saw, I saw you tweet. I saw you tweet there. Like. Yeah. No, actually my name, Elida, not Elina. Elida. Oh, Elida. No, uh, forgive me. I'm just reading uh, as, as per producer script. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so the name is Elida, but then the name of the restaurant is Twala. Twala. Kutwala. Kutwala. In so, okay. In so, yeah, because like the, the logo for Twala is uh -huh. a shield okay. representing my Ngoni side. My father was Ngoni, and the name Twala in Sol in Soli means to take. I see. So Twala. So it's a very traditional name as well. Did Did you spend a lot of time thinking about the, that particular name, or was it something that was so self evident? I spent a bit of time because I kept on doing twelve. I wanted something which was unique and kind of appealed to the rest of the Bantu people of Africa. So you find that Twala is used in a lot of African languages and something, of course, that represented who I am. So I think I spent okay enough, not too long to think about it, but enough time as well. So not bad. Not bad, huh? Mm. Um, 
coming back from Sweden and integrating back into Zambia, how, how was that experience? That was probably the hardest thing I ever had to do in my life. I remember I was depressed for two and a half years. Actually, my depression went out last year. I can say that. It's so hard because culturally and socially, we're totally two different cultures. You find out that most people here, have, it takes slightly longer to mature. Mm -hmm. So you find out that most people my age, 23 and 20, that's when they're like exploring and seeing life. So people just want to go out, party, drink and stuff like that. In where I come from, you do that when you're 16, 15. By the time you're 20, 21, you just want to travel you want to settle down and start establishing yourself mm -hmm. and of course like the cultural difference in how you perceive things how to communicate a lot of females here are not that welcoming if you don't have the same perception even men as well so you find that I was, that was a very hard thing for me and i also had to balance my work mm -hmm. i had to i was a business owner at a very young age where my fellow female friends even male friends wanted to go out i couldn't my job doesn't allow me to go out when when Friday and Saturday, those are the busiest days in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Now, those are the days that your friends want to go out. And the time you want, you have time, they are working or they're busy with something else. So for me, I found that to be extremely hard. And I know I'm not the only one. It's very hard to integrate back into the society of Zambia. Even now it is. So I've just more or less found a schedule that works for me. And yeah, hopefully that will, that will get better. Because now at least I've established myself to be able to travel out. Mm -hmm and meet my childhood friends in Sweden and go to other countries where I can feel like, okay, I'm normal now. Okay, let me go back to Zambia and reintegrate. So, yeah. Uh, I want to take you back to uh, the time you said, uh, you know, when, when you when you decided that you were actually going to study uh, cuisine. Mm -hmm. w was it hard to get into, uh, you know, some of these uh, reputable schools uh, in Switzerland and, and the likes? Not really. Um, the school had, I think before I went there, they had only started the culinary program two years mm -hmm. before, prior to I. And my, my results were actually pretty good when I finished high school, so it wasn't really that hard. And the fact that I am a Swedish citizen <laughs> rather mm -hmm. national, it wasn't it, it wasn't hard for me to get in. So the Cesaris is probably one of the best schools in the world, top ten. So for me, it was just normal. And then the school was an international school, so I could relate to a lot of people. So it wasn't hard mm -hmm. to get in, yeah. It, it, is, it, is it mandatory for, for culinary schools uh, for you to have uh, good grades coming out of high school? Because uh, some would think, one would think that, you know, cuisine, you don't really need, you know, A, a plus or B in math to get into culinary school. In those schools, you need to have, because there's, there's a lot of management, because they don't just teach you how to be a chef. Mm -hmm. Anybody can cook. Um, sorry, they don't teach you how to be a cook. They teach you how to be a chef and an owner and a manager. So you have a lot of subjects where you have to do entrepreneurship, do business organization accounts. Mm -hmm. You have to do law to understand how everything is done. And then you actually really need to have good academic results or prior experience so you can come in because it's a very tough, it's a very intense system. Our terms were only 11 weeks. So they squeeze in. We used to wake up at 8 and knock off at 22. But the whole build, the whole school was in one institute in one building. So mm -hmm. they needed you to be to have that kind of prior experience. And then if you failed your class, you get expelled because you're wasting your parents' money to be there. So you, if you fail a class, you will get expelled. So they needed you to be top notch. Wow. Uh, tell tell us a bit about about your experience in in culinary school. When you when I hear the word culinary school and, and this particular school that you mentioned, the the immediate picture of your uh, what would you call it? Your your professor, for lack of a better word, uh, would be Gordon Ramsay. Uh, our chefs. It, 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 chefs. Yeah, yes, your, your chef uh, professor. What, what, what do you call them? We call them chefs. Okay. Uh, most of the times, yes, they were chefs, but then we did have other professors that okay that teach us, other subjects. Yeah. Um, they varied. We so, so I, I kind of like picture Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> no, really. We had some of them because mm -hmm. they were grouped up about seven. So you had to know how to go about different ones. And But my favorite one was Chef uh, Cortland. He was American. He did a lot of things. He wasn't like the traditional chef. He was just like, oh, let's do this today. And I like that. I like being impulsive. Um, but of course, like if you don't listen, if you don't, they will start screaming. They will start yelling. All the, but the hardest thing came when we asked to go to do our attachments. Because I worked in Swiss, France, and Dubai. And those are the times where you had to duck pants sometimes. And those when reality hit in. And when I went in Dubai, when I was in France and Swiss, I didn't know my French wasn't that really well. 
So you had like the whole brigade and I was the only female there mm-hmm. and they were all speaking French and I was like, oh my gosh, the first three, two months was horrible. But then you get used to it and you're like, you know, this is the job that we've loved, that we've chosen and we love it. So you get used to it. I, I, I want to dig a bit, a bit into the, 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 your day-to-day routine in currently with school. What, what are some of the, the, you know, you mentioned the, a number of subjects that you have to learn. What are some of the things, if you can just run us through one day, in Queen of School. So basically you wake up at 8 in the morning. So those are normal stuff. You go to the kitchen. You get, you get, they divide you in which sections. Because you have the cold kitchen, hot kitchen, and your pastry. Or if you're going to be chef of the day, whatever. And then you have to do the whole menu thing. And then you'll be there up to 2 uh, after lunch. Because you have to serve the whole school. Either that or you have the dining hall that you have to serve. Then at 2 you go and have your French class. You go and have your organization. All the classes that you need to have up to 16 then you are called back to the kitchen you have to work you have to do a whole proper service mm-hmm. and 2 20 21 22 and then you repeat that the following day wow is it is there any time when you thought uh, maybe i chose the wrong career let me let me call my parents and uh change uh, my subject matter not really because i remember when i was young i used to do a lot of sports i used to play football and then in sweden if people have been there it's very cold and then I've, I understand being a sports person because you have to do all the preseason stuff and those are horrible and I won't I will forever remember this what one of my coaches told me we are complaining no we are tired they were like no when you start working you're going to be so grateful because all this hardship that you're going through now when you start working you just be a walk over because you are so used to it and it was actually very true when I went to culinary school all their heart like the physical and the mental stuff had already experienced that so for me it was just like oh okay What's, what else is new? So I didn't have uh, a challenge to do. Wow. Amazing. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So why, why not stay a chef in Dubai or France or Switzerland? Why come back to Zambia? All right. So the reason why I decided to not stay in France and Swiss for the first, I wanted to explore the world. Mm-hmm. Um, then I had a choice either going to the States or going to Dubai. Um, I wanted to go to Dubai because I was 21 at the time, 20, yeah, I was 20, 21, 22. I wanted to explore the world. It's very important. And then Dubai gives you a specific gives a certain culture that you've never experienced before. I chose not to stay there because I have always wanted to contribute back to the culinary industry in Zambia and Africa in whole. I feel like very few people have had the privilege I have had to go to these schools, work in these countries and gain the knowledge that I have both within the culinary industry and then socially rather and culturally. And I wanted to come back here. There's always been a certain calling that has always called me back to Zambia. And of course, you always like, oh, did I make the right decision? Sometimes you also think about it because time is still there. Mm-hmm. But it's been rewarding, so I cannot complain. How, how did you get your name coming back into Zambia? How, how did you establish yourself? How did you find your feet? Was it easy to, for you to establish yourself? Y- yes, because when I started culinary school, I started writing for the Post. Okay. Yeah, and then when, by the time I was almost done, uh, I could go on radio stations, and then they'll be like, oh, what do you want to talk about? And then the easiest way to say was like, oh, you work for the Post, you're the chef. So that gained me a lot of mileage, and then, of course, I've been on ZNBC. And all. So for me, it was easier stuff so i realized that was the strategy for me to get into the media and the zambia because i started already early so i was it was kind of easy for me but but uh apart apart for it being easy what, what are some of the challenges that you've faced in terms of uh setting up your own business and and then just being a chef a female chef in zambia for that matter exactly uh i think first of all employers that it's always hard to get the right people that you want to convey your message to and it takes a certain experience to learn how to go about all of this stuff and then i know that in that one thing i've realized that when you go to a lot of restaurants most of them they fail because they want to do too many things and then i understand because you have customers of people around you like try this try this try this do you're going to get a lot of customers at once but then you are in business you don't take a year for you to boom out i remember you know dangora said he took me 30 years to be where i am right now and that's something that i've learned before i used to have a challenge you just want to have quick money and do all these other stuff looking at what people are doing but then this year's when the year i've learned you know let me just do one thing let me be patient about it it will eventually pick off and other than the just balancing everything else you know being a young chef and i think like culturally wise Mm -hmm. you know females are very like they're very nice and to their female 
husbands or mm-hmm. but they don't it's, it's it's a taboo for us to be that you know serving people who are not your husband so when you find out before the customers you now used to but that's part of our education when i serve them i smile and so they feel like oh okay this one is very friendly and mm-hmm. stuff then mm-hmm. i'm like no i'm just doing my job mm-hmm. and of course um the attention comes with it people don't understand that's just my job if you are going to be if you know me personally that's different but then professionally it's also another different aspect so people have a very hard time balancing okay this is Lillian when she's at work and this is Lillian when she's a personal person yeah wow um so what would you say makes Twala unique me and my uh, and my team members I would call them because we are so and my partners because it's a partnership now we want to we've understood that just a few years ago not more than seven that's when zambian started going out to eat and you know getting out to the restaurant world and we don't want to come away from i'm not focusing even though i could do it i'm not focusing on doing you know making muzungu food rather in that way the majority of the in the majority of zambians are black zambian born here you understand nobody's going to be ordering smoothies all the time ordering fish you find that more than 90% we all eat our staple food and the other 10% that's when you want to mix up everything else so we are now create we are now I've learned how the zambian person eats what the trend is how to go about it and now we are taking that information that we've learned as a team trying to put a system and management that will now enable us to grow uh, branch out and now develop a brand and a company that people will associate Zambian cuisine. When you want to eat Zambian cuisine, where do you go? You eat you go to Twala. When you want to when you want to set up a restaurant and you want to get information, who do you go to? Lillian Elida or you go to her team members. That's the system that I have, I think makes us unique. We are focusing on the core the core of the corners of the Zambian culinary arts, but we are taking it to a professional aspect. I'm not really concerned about having 100 people come to eat at my restaurant. As long as I get enough people that it would take for me to break even and make a profit, but at the same time I'm learning because the, the knowledge that I'm gaining now is what's going to sustain me when I when I want to open my resort, when I want to go to other parts of the country to open up. Lusaka is not just Zambia, and as we know other parts are developing. So that's what I'm looking at. L- Lillian, you, you've raised some uh, interesting points that I want to touch on. Uh, firstly, uh, wh- why did you uh, find it necessary to uh, enter into a partnership? My my team members, my partners have been with me since I started. And as I mentioned, it's very hard, even everywhere you go in the world, but somehow, specifically in Zambia, to find very loyal people. I They were with me when we had no money, when we went bankrupt as a company and we had to figure out. And I feel they understand my vision they understood it then that's why we decided to merge together and surprisingly 99 percent of my team members are females they're young females and they know like we have they know we have a vision to go to it's not just now and i felt like it's part of me i i don't like i don't like being selfish those are the people that were in five years from now where they will, they will, they will, they will be the ones who will take Twala further on. They are going to train they, the next upcoming generations who will be working for our company then. They will be able to train them. I'm sharing the knowledge that I have gained. And then I'm also, they are also sharing with me their strength and loyalty. So we can train up the next generation of Twala employees so that our business can further on stay and advance. That's my vision. My vision is not to make a million kwacha this year. My vision is 20 years. I'm still making money. I'm still in business, and we're still developing. Interesting. Uh, you, you talked about the corners uh, of, uh, of your business, which is, uh, you mentioned an interesting figure, and, and I want to find out uh, more about that. You said seven years ago, Zambia started eating, and, and, and you're monitoring. Uh, you came up with a system that basically takes into account what Zambians eat. Enlighten us a bit on that. Well, why, why do you say seven years ago? Because I would argue, for instance, to say, well, Zambians were eating in 2000. Not really, because I, since I moved to Sweden, I, my, my, my parents made sure that I had to come back to Zambia just to acquaint myself with the culture. We never, most of the times, people would just go and eat like a pie or whatever in town. Even traditional foods weren't, weren't in 
demand or popular then and i've just realized seven years ago that's when things started coming off and in terms of food zambian people are very particular with their food but you like it to have it simple you don't want to be like what le le c'est foie gras avec la la you just like okay this is chicken with with chihuahua. Chicken. exactly stuff like that so but then it takes a certain knowledge to know about it and I feel like I've gotten to know, like, okay, they will like this. Let me try this. Let me go about it. And then it's just simplicity. In Zambia, we like it simplicity, but we also want to be like, yeah, that is the thing. And that's always a balance for a lot of restaurant owners to find. If you are targeting the average Zambian person, though, mm-hmm. unless you're targeting the Muzungu expatriates, rather, mm-hmm. there is very simple. And, and, and what 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 come from uh, the trends that you, you say that you you, you follow in the trains, the eating trends of Zambians? What 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 is it that you found interesting in these trends? That if other than that, they like it simple. Yeah, other than like for instance, I remember quails three years ago. They were very in. Everybody was talking about quails, quails when come now. Nobody even asking about them so and then the trends tend to fail, fall off very quickly even soup yambos you remember like three years yeah. ago everybody was like soup yambos now people are just like let me just get goat you see but then if you're a business owner you need to understand yes i need to fit i need to fit in the trend but then you need to have an eye for the future and that's what that we like following like okay the trend 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 and as a business owner you cannot think unless your business is just for that particular trend that's I think that's the most important thing I've noticed. And in order for you to notice like that's how you're going to stay in business, I think. Don't don't as a business owner restaurant don't go too much in the trend. When the trend dies off, what are you going to survive on? It's going to be very hard. Go back to the core business, I mean mission statement of your business. Stick to it. Eventually, you're going to you're going to gain your customers, and as long as you get lo- your loyal ones, always try to evolve. And I'm so grateful that I do have my loyal customers, and we're evolving every single time. And they've seen that since I started being in business up to now, they've seen change in how the business is run, in myself, and in the whole system, to be particular. Okay, um, I like that you're very honest with the fact that you went bankrupt at some point. Yes. Uh, how do you come back from being bankrupt? What type of mindset does it take? The most important thing is to know why you started and where you want to go. I was bankrupt and I really felt bad because I remember we had to sell one of our houses to pay back what I, the money that I loaned because I was 22. I didn't do proper enough research about the restaurant industry, what what took and everything else. And I had to sell one of my houses to pay back the loan, the, the loan that I got. And that for me was like, I am never, ever, ever, ever going through that. Um... What would take you back? Because you know, like, you've sold one of your forever assets. And there's no other option than going forward. What else do you have to lose? I remember we only had, like, seven kwacha when <laughs> when we were bankrupt. And we had to change to the location where, to the place where we are in now. With my now business partner. We're staying together. And we're like, what are we going to eat? And then we went to Chadley, the bakery, to go and buy buns. Because they rem- they stay forever. And mm. then those kind of things. But I've... I've I have I've grown up to never give in and never give up. So I was just like, you know what? Let's do this and to be I am grateful for my parents. I wouldn't have done it without them and I know a lot of people will be like, "Oh, you know what? Be entrepreneurship and come into business. You really need to have either parents who support you both emotionally and financially because it's hard." It's really hard getting the money and everything else. But then you also have to know what you want. I know a lot of business people have borrowed money from their parents to say, and then time and time again, they've gone bankrupt. They continue borrowing money from their parents. But eventually it will pay off. You just have to work extremely hard for it to pay off. You mentioned that uh, you you borrowed money to uh, start up your business. What is it about the... uh uh, restaurant industry that you did not uh, perhaps uh, you know research enough that that made you you know uh, that eventually led to to bankruptcy everything because everything that we learned in uh, in school and all the other doesn't apply in Zambia at all the marketing doesn't apply because here word of mouth is the biggest marketing that you get the um, in the uh, the countries I worked in and culinary school we were taught you have supplies as a chain of system that goes around in order for you to receive food in zambia don't even have that because most farmers don't are not even targeting restaurant owners in other countries farmers would be like 
I'm about to start growing goats. Can I please start supplying you? you? How do you want it? They come and beg for you here. They're like, whatever. Let me just go to any supermarket and sell. Or Soweto. Exactly. They want quick money either. Everything. And then, of course, that the industry is not is not developed. You have chefs. When they go to the schools here, they 90%, I can honestly say, they don't know most of it, what really happens in a kitchen. You have waitresses and people have gone to hospitality schools. The basic of knowledge and service they don't have. You more or less have to start planning and training again. So for me, it was like, oh, this is completely different from what I learned in culinary school and the experiences that I've had now that I've come to Zambia. So I, I think that I believe that I needed to go through that to now relearn again. And from what I've relearned and the knowledge that I have from my school, I can now balance it off and start doing it, start putting things in a more systematic way. If you were to name three things that are perhaps led to uh, to bankruptcy, in hindsight, what 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 would those three things be? Research, mm, being impatient, and thirdly, being unrealistic. In what can you can you define those three? Because uh, as chefs and people who open restaurants, most of us we love food. Yeah, we want to create all this. Um, in terms of the unrealistic part, we want to make sure that, oh, you see our presentation, you are like, ah, uh, you know, like, but then you find that the individual just wants to have chicken and chips. And there you've done, you've done chicken Kiev with pom kratang and everything else. And the person was like, do you have chicken and chips? <laughs> and then the ingredients and the cost that's going to make that dish is completely almost 90% more than what it would cost to make chicken and chips. And in terms of being patient, you just want you just want your dream to come in like, yeah, yeah, I'm so excited. And you're not taking enough time to research and find out what's happening. And in terms of finding out what's happening, it's very hard for people who've owned business before, it's very restaurant, to tell you like, these are the mistakes that I did. Don't try to do this. It's very hard because most of them are older people and then i was 22 and i'm like who am i going to be talking to thirdly it was what was the third part i mentioned research mm-hmm. what do zambian like what do zambians like sorry um i didn't do enough research because for me i had a vision which i still have for my restaurant and that is to do modern fusion ethnic cuisine if, if I may say that. But you find the people that I was hanging around with, they were going to, say, the Muzungu restaurants where they were doing, like, you know, international cuisines and stuff like that. I felt like we didn't have enough restaurants who could, to, on that professional level, who could represent our Zambian cuisine. And that's what I wanted to do. Now I had to learn what is Zambian cuisine? What do people like within the Zambian cuisines? How are you going to make them understand that you're not cooking village chicken from home, you're cooking from the restaurant? Because some of the difficulties that I find now. Somebody will be like, why are you selling your chicken at 80 kwacha or 40 kwacha when the chicken is 25 kwacha? And I'm like, but you're buying that for home. Do you know how many markups I have to make for, in order for me to get my profit? Because the, most Zambians have that mentality like, oh, I buy this chicken at this much. Why are you selling at this much? They don't understand that you have so many other things that you need to put in consideration as well. So yeah, those three things I can say. All right. Um, I guess we're we're at a point now where we're trying to make Zambia into this this wonderful place. We're trying to market ourselves. I think uh, you know ethnic cuisines can can, can help us market ourselves. Do you, I don't know how you feel about that. That's why I wanted to ask you. And uh, maybe we could use the the Chikanda burger as. <laughs> I, think, I do like the Chikanda burger. <laughs> it's very important. Hospitality is extremely important in any country's economic growth, and especially the fact that, for instance, me, the places I've traveled to, the first thing that I want to go and see is like, what is your food like? How is your culture like? You understand? And then they sell it in that way where, if you go to a specific country, you know, like for instance, Sweden, you know the Swedish meatballs. You understand? And this, when somebody goes to visit Sweden for the first time, they always look up the things that you need to eat in Sweden. And in Zambia, we have all those things. But then it also comes into presentation. You're not going to have a Chinese person here coming to eat delele. Like, yes, they can eat it, but with your fingers, and then it just looks like that. You need to present it in a nice way and explain to them why we eat it with with our hands. Why is that slimy? Because Chinese, I mean, say, Japanese cuisine doesn't have the niciest like you know the most usual taste buds the mm-hmm. real one but people have gotten used to the sushi and sushi 
but maybe that's the most popular stuff because mm-hmm. I know they have more like raw stuff that mm-hmm. people are not used to. But people are falling in love with that cuisine, and for other people, be like that's gross. But then other people love it, and that's why they're so popular. They've explained why we eat it like this, why it's made like this way, and they've made it. They've presented it in a nice way where you'd be like, oh, that's a masterpiece. But here we just present our visashi in a bowl like eat. Even you be like if if you don't know where it's coming from, you be like ah na ya bisashi how? Ma vi pick up one. Am I not going to get sick in my stomach? You see if it's not from home. Those are the aspects that we need to work on. And unfortunately, unfortunately, only I, only professionals most can take that because we are told how to present, how to relay, and tell a story behind our food. A normal chef cannot. I mean, a normal cook cannot do that. You can get yes, but my auntie to pick the best bisashi. How is she going to present it on a plate for it to be appealing to the world? That's where the professionals come in, and that's very important for us to take further our cuisine and industry. Lillian, we'll take a short break. When we come back, uh, we want to find out what is the story behind your food that is the the, the African fusion of uh, modern cuisine and also talk about uh, Zambia's agricultural potential in uh, helping the hospitality and uh, restaurant industry at large. Today on the Startup Hour, we're discussing feeding Zambia and locking Zambia's agriculture potential with uh, Lillian Elida, founder of Twala. Lillian Elida is a professional chef with working experience in Sweden, Zambia, France, and Swiss We'll be right back after this short break. The Startup Hour, giving entrepreneurs education, motivation, and inspiration from successful entrepreneurs from all corners of the country. Welcome back. Today on the Startup Hour, we're discussing feeding Zambia and unlocking Zambia's agricultural potential with Lillian Elida, founder of the Antwala. Uh, uh, Lillian is a professional chef with working experience in Sweden, Zambia, France, and uh, Switzerland, amongst uh, many other countries. She is a food writer for the Post newspaper. She was born in Zambia, raised in Sweden, and uh, she's also uh, chef and owner of Antwala companies under which she runs and operates the Antwala restaurant. Now, Lillian, mm-hmm. what is the story behind uh, African fusion or modern cuisine? Uh, that is mixing, that's taking chikanda, which, which in the culinary term is actually terrine, putting it on a nice home-baked bread, burger bread, with some light lettuce, and maybe do um, tartar sauce base, and put it with some glazed onions, and eat it with some really nice french fries. That's basically what modern fusion is. Uh, For me, uh, the reason I've named it modern fusion is the fact that as I mentioned earlier, the presentation in our cuisines is not really the best. And the fact that we tend to always go tomato, onion, tomato, onion, salt, tomato, onion, and salt, when there's so many other ingredients that we can always pair them up with. So I'm trying, I've, I've been experimenting with getting different herbs and spices and giving it a new look and giving new ingredients to the stuff that we make. And it's been, it's received a good response so far. And that's what I mean with the modern fusion cuisine. To fusion up basically everything that we have in Africa per se. In East Africa, they use a lot of coconut oil. I mean, a lot of coconut milk. Mm-hmm. We can incorporate that in ours as well. So um, it's just a feel of experimenting and creating because it's called culinary arts. We are artists. We are chefs, artists in the kitchen. And it's our job to create new things. And in other countries, though, how it works, if a chef, for instance, creates a new dish, say the Chikanda burger, they'll market it so well. You know, you invite all the newspapers and whatnot, and they'll come talk about this new trend here. And that's how people now be like, oh my God, have you seen that thing in the newspaper? Let's go and try it out. Let's go and try it. Those are how trends are created. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what I'm hoping on doing as well. Cause, but then those people are free, are free, are free minded to try new things. And then they'll be like, ah, that looks really nice, but oh, let me just give me just Shiman Village chicken. That's the problem, but it's, it's getting there. You, you, you mentioned the fact that uh, we, we're so straightforward with our onion and tomato in, in every dish. Uh, we're so simple in what we like to eat. Is that a challenge for someone like you who's into uh, creating, uh, you know, fusional modern cuisine? The fact that uh, we like it simple, the fact that uh, we would not want to have cassava rather than maize meal, perhaps. Yes, and th- in terms of that one, I have developed Twalanshima, which has maize meal, cassava, and millet in it. And then people love it. It's our top selling shima. It sells more than the breakfast one for first. Then, secondly, 
in Zambia, we love simple food, but we love tasty food. Don't get me wrong. You can make, yes, tomato, onion, and salt in a beef stew, but if it doesn't taste like beef, or even, people will be like, this wasn't nice. And then that's now part of us chefs to, or your restaurant owners, to make sure that the food that you're serving your clients is of good quality, is tasty, yet you cook it in a way where they can feel the taste. And that's, that's how it is. Even villa chicken. They want to taste that villa chicken tasty that our grandmothers used to make. But if you're going to get some other chicken that doesn't taste like that, people will be like, mm, mm, mm. No matter how simple you've cooked it. So, yes, simplicity in flavor is very important, but then also the flavor over we, overpowers everything else. Do you think we're moving in a direction where we're, we're able more than uh, before to appreciate uh, the different, uh, uh, what can I call them, different ingredients perhaps or different uh, staple foods that we have that we could could be incorporated into your modern cuisine yes we are the only problem is that people don't have a lot of time and those things they take a bit more time to learn and um, i get surprised because i know people do a lot of chilanga mulilo and whatever so I was, one of the clients came and like mm, the reason why we go to these restaurants we come to restaurants like this eating offers even though our women are told all oh, these chilanga mulilo i mean i mean all these dishes during those times they really cook it and i can understand the women it takes time those things and it takes time and preparation to make it so i think it's the balance we we always struggle in our society here to find the balance of things where you want to try out a lot of things but it's time con it's time consuming and you cannot blame neither parties who doesn't have time for that but i feel like it's my job as a chef and people in my food to take it on forth okay in in eastern province for instance you have or say south in lusaka province the soul is we have something what we call kalili which is tomato sashila tomatoes mm -hmm. you see and then people be like uh but i've never had it before so it's it's a mix of it it's a mix of a lot of things but open minded open being open minded helps a lot because then you it enables you to try out different things other than just your usual Way. I'll give an example in West Africa, for instance, and I, and I suppose East Africa as well. You, you will find that uh, many, many, many times uh, in, in a week, uh, the people there are not stuck to one staple food. For instance, they, you know, like we eat mealy meal day in, day out, mm -hmm. but you find that they you know they, they 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 switch between cassava, plantain, bananas, rice, you know, uh, millet, Healthy, and so many exactly. things. But w why do you think you know from from your 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 research why do you think zambians are so stuck on on, on uh, maize meal i wish i was there in the 90s <laughs> when but i was so young i think it all comes back with history that's what i'm saying it's like somebody decided must be the business the the company owners this food company they decided okay we have a lot of white maize and we need to sell it what's the way of that's the best way of selling it let's just say roll me anything that looks brown is not nice you see and they started selling it that way and then zambians were like oh this roller meal, it looks dirty. Because even our kids, I have parents who be like, my child says, this brown shimmer is dirty, dirty, dirty. But they don't understand that's really, it's very healthy. And that's part of our tradition. You understand? I think everything has always been told, eat this way from the food companies. And I'm hoping that now, the fact that I'm in media, I can help to change that part. It's the mentality that we have. Because as I mentioned, if something comes in a way that's not cooked, or it's not supposed to be like you think no it's wrong in west africa you have delele mixed in beef stew and mm -hmm. whatever here even though you can have delele separately beef stew here and it's going to be mixed in, in anyways mm -hmm. when you eat it but just because it comes mixed in people won't eat and they feel like ew 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 but then they don't know it it might be really tasty and i think that companies took advantage of that and wanted to sell their products and they put it in they they presented it in a way where saying everything else is not nice eat this which is nice because even bread now for breakfast i love my porridge i love the fact that certain companies now are doing this soya maize porridge mm -hmm. that's what i eat candolo i love those things but then we've been stuck with the bread and butter thing and that's and then that's white bread, white bread it can yeah. only last you for a, for a week for a, uh, for an hour or two because those are fast carbs mm -hmm. and that's why when it comes to lunch you just want to eat shimmer you understand and then for me i'm like but why so it's the mentality that we need to start changing it can only start changing when people like me myself my fellow colleagues who are in the industry and of course the food companies they really need to start saying and more or less the government the government has to introduce that Saying, you guys, yes, we know you love shima, but have you tried this millet? 
have you tried eating millet leaves or have you tried this whatever to to get going because at the end they are going we are going to struggle with malnutrition in the country where we have all these different varieties of food but people are just choosing to eat maize and this is where the part now the government has to start introducing involving people like myself people who are in the food industry farmers to introduce these new things on the market that's the only way to go and we can have a healthy population of zambians all right um, um you touched on something very important which is nutrition because at the end of the day nutrition is what determines how far you go as a person exactly right? well, uh, how good you'll be at your job exactly. uh, yeah uh, someone called it gray matter infrastructure mm -hmm. yeah for the brain because your brain depends on what you eat um, being after you came back you said we have a problem with tomatoes and onions mm. now as a chef how how did you uh, should I say jump that barrier whereby you are able to get to source different kinds of um, ingredients for the foods you make I wouldn't say that and then we don't have a problem I said that we tend to use a lot of tomato and onions in our dish and then as a business person and of course a person who have so much respect for Zambian cuisine I haven't gone away from the tomato and onion that's how my that's how my pa, my grandmother used to cook but what I've done is the restaurant Twala for instance at lunchtime we do in Shima then in the evening I come in now and present other things like we have the ribs for instance we have uh, we have sandwiches and we have chickens that, that can be, be prepared in the normal way but then I am adding a different kind of feel like our salad for instance is made out of cabbage but we don't use mayonnaise we use other local stuff that people be like oh my god what's this salad? we have men who never who most of the time don't eat salads but then they just come and say our clients where's that salad you need to put salad on my chicken and those are the small steps that we have to take you have to be willing to step out to see what people love and you have to force them to yeah. like like it. that's what business is all about you present a thing make people love it Quasila. what what is the secret ingredient that you have in your salads <laughs> that that doesn't involve mayonnaise it's the dressing mm -hmm. yes it's a dressing and it's secret yeah <laughs> nah you wouldn't know but you have to come and try it out because like, people love it and then i just use cabbage which is a very local affordable and then it's accessible but then i add it's the dressing simple even the dressing we use the local i mean white vinegar that zambian uh, manufacturers buy but then i know that okay just let me not do the average stuff let me use something else and people love it it sells L lillian you're creative and uh, in your cooking in your culinary skills i want us to to touch on that in the in the last part of the show i want us to unlock zambia's uh, agricultural potential why, why did you see the need to uh, set up Antwala Farms? Antwala Farms, for me, have always had a passion for farming and agriculture. I grew up in a very big farm, uh, agriculture family, and I love, I love the fact that you grow something, you start the process, and then you see it grow. You're like, I did that? All right, great. Then the second part was, as I mentioned earlier, we are trained as chefs to say you are farmers who come to you and say please start buying from me this is what i can give you let's work out an agreement i understand you, you understand me let me let us help grow each other's business and on top of that you tell them i want these specifications can you do this you find that most farmers have no knowledge on this on the stuff that you want them to bring for you you see and then i said no 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 for me my vision in for my for twala is to have res resorts basically we have retreats around the country and then grow our restaurants around the country and possibly venture off into other countries i need to have i need to have good produce and product that where i know that even though i send to my restaurant i know that i have produced this using this and this it will be top-notch quality because a, a, a vegetable that hasn't grown properly and they've added whatever considered uh, compared to the one which has been nurtured and nursed correctly you can taste that in flavor it's a shame that a lot of people don't understand and that's something that we chefs understand especially when it comes to animals if you fed them a specific grain or you know, it changes how they grow how the meat tastes even if how you kill them changes everything a lot of farmers don't understand that 
and I felt the need to say, you know what, it, the younger generation of restaurant owners who are coming in, they should not struggle the way I've struggled or I continue to struggle. Going to supermarkets to buy all these other stuff and whatnot. Let me be a part of a product who will be able to say, you guys, all right, this is the packages we have. We have for high-end restaurants. We have for hotels. But we, ho- we also have for you small small restaurant owners. Let me... Let me let me help you grow. Because what I've noticed, the other restaurants and cafes around, which are owned by other ethnic groups, if I may say, they support each other. If Mwape, for instance, grows strawberries and he grows whatever, and you, obviously you know me because we hang around the same people, you're able, you'll be able to call me saying, oh, Lillian, somebody told me you have a restaurant. Can I supply you this? Like You know, they cooperate. But you find the majority of them is they don't. They don't come and say, I grow this, can I come? And, no, you don't. And because I don't know if it may be the selfishness or whatever it is, but I feel that that's very wrong. It's killing our industry. You're not gaining anything by not helping the next person. And then if they grow, they'll be get, they will remember you, hopefully. And that's the reason why I decided, because I never had those people who, ca- who came to me and said, I'm growing this, can I? And then they wanted to create a partnership. Because farmers don't understand that a business, I cannot order 500, I cannot order 5 kgs of, tom- of rape. First of all, it's going to go bad. I have to take into consideration that the electricity stuff hasn't... And I have to order what will suit me for that. And then you, it varies. The other week, you don't order that much. The other week, you order that much. They don't seem to understand that part. The, how the rest, They just want to get money. And that's very bad, especially for younger hot, I mean, hot, uh, restaurant owners. And mm. I re- I, that's the reason why I wanted to venture that. Because I am thinking, what if my children want to be chefs? Who's going to help them? At least if I can start up with the foundation for them to know that, okay, this is what's there already. They can be able to take on the the, the restaurant industry further on. The, who, who, whose job do you feel uh, it should be to, you know, kind of like educate, uh, you know, upcoming farmers or farmers that are, already exist <clears throat> that they need to develop this kind of relationship with uh, hotels, restaurants and, and lodges and, and whatnot? I feel like they are, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to say that I know, but I do know that there are certain farmers who do that already. But remember, as I mentioned, it's all about connection. The way I started, I was 22 and then I didn't know, I didn't know a lot of people. And then if you go and search, they don't say we supply you. And then to find a farmer who could say she's not st- she's not making a lot of money yet, but then let me see if I can grow with her. Mm-hmm. Out, out of the out of the portion that I supply these people, let me supply her so she can grow. You don't find that a lot. And then whose job is that to do that? I'm I personally I, I'm not a person who goes and starts saying, give me a loan, government do this, people help me. Nobody's going to do that for you because they won't understand your vision. I took it upon myself, like, okay, nobody's, nobody's doing this. Let me start. It might take me five, ten years, but I will reach there. And as I mentioned, it's all about, mm, how, what, I would, what can I call it? It's all about, it's all about people being less selfish and th- being considerate. When your business dies, wouldn't you want to say, ah, okay, me, I won't manage but then some, one of your employees or a team member will say, okay, you know what, boss, you can relax. Since you've taught me everything, let me take the business further on. And you'll be like, and that's, for me, we were trained to do that. Because if I leave, for instance, my business, and then they cannot run, manage without me, they fail. Then I know I've failed in, no matter how many sleepless hours, how much money I've made, whatever. If they cannot manage a business without me being there, whatever, everything else I've done has basically failed. Because the purpose of a business is to manage People, the people you're training up, being able to manage it without you. And that's something that I feel like people, business owners don't really understand. Because I was thinking, if I teach you this, you're going to be better than me. And that's great. Like, I remember the reels that we have at the restaurant. The girl, I told her, like, the secrets to all of this stuff. And then when I, when I got, when I introduced ribs on the menu, I told her, create a recipe and make the sauce. And now, I rem- a lot of people are praising for that thing. Whenever they praise it, I never take credit. I always tell her, come and hear what they're saying. Those are the kind of mentality. So I think it needs to start with people being less selfish. And if possible, get together with other people who are in the industry. And I, people fail to understand that we can be in the in- same industry, but we are all, our visions are different. Of course, we all want to succeed, but our visions are different. And at the end of the day, it's the customers who are going to decide. And no customer will eat the same type of food every single day or come to the same restaurant every single day. You go out and try, but at the end, you know where you want to go. And I feel that it's, 
you know try try by yourself get get to know if get to know people can maybe help you along the way and 90% of them just want to take advantage you know like cuz you're you're naive you're so you want to achieve so many things they will they take your money they will lie to you they will promise you things they won't achieve. but eventually you start meeting those people who slowly either start giving you more knowledge and giving you advice on how you can go about it so what 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 was uh, Antwala's uh, vision and uh, uh, Antwala Farms vision uh, did you did you plan or are you planning on uh, growing uh, specific uh, types of uh, vegetables or or, or, or other uh, what is, what is the vision for for Antwala Farms My vision is to grow excellent mostly organic produce that will cater foremost for the hotel and restaurant industry and then for the other for the other people I want I want people to understand that and then cuz like the farm is near where I'm going to start building my resort. I want when you come to Rufunsa it's in Rufunsa by the way. When you come then you come and stay at the resort and you try the food and you'll be like, "Oh, this food is amazing because the way we've taken care of it." Um that's my vision. My vision is of course to grow specific crops and specific produce that will be that will be on demand for mostly the hotel and restaurant industry and cater for those people because i think if the home the, the domestic in produce are everywhere and people are not yet on that level wanting to try different things and but it takes a lot of knowledge it takes a lot of research and commitment to do it because you have to wait for it you have to learn how what goes what doesn't go and there's a chef now when i grow something now i try tasting with different things and then see if there's a difference in texture and taste in flavor and they'll be like okay then now you take it to the people like you what do you think of which one do you like the most and you start growing in that way so it's a process that's why you have a lot of farmers or people who've been supplying they've been hit they've been around for years because it took them like 5 years to actually get a routine that corresponds with the demand and the expectation of your produce for for those who are not in uh, in farming what well, what should one understand by the term uh, organic you said you 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 intend to grow a lot of organic produce what does that mean yeah by not using a lot of chemi- chemicals and not adding stuff like artificial fertilizers and stuff like that it's very hard though because this year i i did my first i did i did my first try of farming this year i made a loss a complete loss i wish i can give back my money but it's okay <laughs> i got again knowledge so this year i'm more i am more not i am more aware i'm going to start next week month actually to prepare for it i'm doing all the research and i want to go as organic as possible and do conservation farming and yeah just grow my business because i love it it's such a fulfill it's such a hard, i never understood how hard it was until i woke up 5 in the morning because certain crops you have to plant them in a certain moon a certain time mm-hmm. temperature and you have to wait and then Rufunsa that area of Rufunsa where I am in Chimsanya basically never got any rains other parts got but we never got and it messed up my whole plan for this past year but this year I'm willing I never give up and I know in the next 3 to 4 years I'll be very good and one of the best farming businesses around that will cater mostly for the hotel and restaurant industry. Do, do, do you hope to use uh, your Antwala Farms as, as a model maybe for other uh, farmers that are that would w- want to help other businesses in the in the hotel and industry uh, hotel industry grow? Yes, I, I hope so cuz what the other farmers don't have is my culinary aspect of it where we know as chefs or res- restaurant owners we expect a certain quality a certain maturity because if you're going rape for instance as a farmer would be like oh i'm just waiting for the rape to grow so i can harvest in a lot of but then as a chef i would tell you like oh can you please give me the rape when it's at like 3 weeks old because i want to use it in my salad i want to make a specific dish and you're thinking like mm, but i've spent i've invested in a lot of money in this how am i going to get it back is those kind of now it's my job now to see as a farm as a business how I'm going to get money from it and how I'm how am I going to benefit the culinary industry at the same time all right you've you've pretty much covered the entire agribusiness aspect from being a, a, a restaurant owner a chef now we have the startup power challenge <laughs> i hope it's not one of those because i don't maybe i've become better but i hate what do you call them like yeah. those questions like um either or okay go on <laughs> all right so you're expected to answer without thinking all right yes yeah, so you just go M- impulsive mm-hmm. all right are you ready yes go on what's at the top of your bucket list top 
You're thinking. You're thinking. Yeah, yeah, sorry, you're no, 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 you know the thing is, okay, 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 you have to start again. I speak a lot of languages. <laughs> so when somebody speaks, I have to process them, you know, different languages. Like, what did he mean? <laughs> All right, top bucket list is to be happy, number one, and not number one, to be very successful and have a happy life. Okay. Mm. What's the last movie you watched? Game of Thrones. <laughs> Mossy or Castle? Neither. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Who inspires you? Mm, my mother. What's the worst advice you've ever received? Do this, do that, do that from people who have never had any experience or are not in my business. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what's your shower song? Ladies, let's get information. <laughs> um, any dinner guest you would have, living or dead, who would you invite? Ah, oh, Mr. Edgar Lungu. <laughs> He's our president. So pass through, Mr. <laughs> president. <laughs> what advice would you give your younger self? Be patient, Lillian. Be patient. All right. And what's your guilty pleasure? I'm trying. There's a lot. Oh, my <laughs> God. Bread. I need to stop eating bread. <laughs> White bread. Yes, bread. I need to stop. It's hard when you work in a restaurant industry. <laughs> Lillian, it's been a pleasure having you on the Startup Hour show. Thank you very much. It has indeed been a very informative and insightful session all rolled up into one today on the Startup Hour show. We were talking, we're discussing feeding Zambia and locking Zambia's agricultural potential with Lillian Ellie, the founder of Untwala. Lillian is a professional chef working uh, with working experience in Sweden, Zambia, France, and Switzerland. She's also a food writer. She was born and raised uh, in Lusaka, uh, born in Lusaka rather, raised in Switzerland and studied in Switzerland. She's also chef and owner of Untwala companies under which she runs and operates the Twala restaurant. Many thanks again for coming through the Startup Hour show today. Uh, be sure to join us uh, next week, same time, same day, as we bring you more inform inf influential business and thought leaders. Be inspired and remember, the only person responsible for Zambia's development is you. So what are you doing about it? This has been Startup Hour, bringing successful Zambian entrepreneurs, policymakers, and subject experts to share their stories. Startup Hour in association with Power FM.